Okay, so let's get started. Um, so the REST stands for Representational State Transfer, and that is uh, the first two letters from representational and then state transfer. Of what? So it's of resources, right? So when you say representational, it's just uh, a terminology that's used to indicate what format the web server is going to send. It's going to send some, send some data in some language, uh, in some format, right? XML, HTML, CSV, it's just going to be bits and ones and zeros, right? When a client interacts, it's going to send back a response. So representations can be any different format. And what is state? State, actually, uh, uh, there is two different states identified by the RESTful web services uh, written by Leonard Richardson and uh, Sam Ruby. So it basically says uh, the state, uh, state is, you can have a client state and you can have a server state, okay? When you have a client state, that is the application state. So when I'm doing a search on Google and searching for a certain things, uh, I could be uh, uh, searching for a term, some term, object A. I could be on page one, and you could be doing the same search on object A, and you could be on page two, for instance, okay? Your client and my client are at different states, uh, different parts of the application, okay? Whereas a resource that is being exposed it's it's uh, it's not uh, it's in the same state. It's a different representation. You're on the first uh, nav first page of the navigation, and uh, you I'm on the second page of the navigation. So there's those are the different kinds of things uh, that's happening. So the state basically a uh, transfer transfer in which direction? Okay, the transfer of state can happen from the client to the server and the server to the client. When the transfer of state happens from the client to the server, you basically are creating a, a, a something on the server side by doing a post, and maybe you're updating a, a existing resource by doing a put, and so on. So the client state propagates to the server, and it becomes a resource state. So the server state is basically the resource state. The Ruby meetup? Yeah, it's here. So we just started. Okay. So uh, the client state uh, is whatever the uh, human user is actually entering some data and he's creating certain resource and it gets propagated and when you create a particular resource on the server side, it becomes a resource state, okay? And when you do a get, uh, a, a get for a certain number of, uh, I don't know, list or something of certain resources, you're making a request and that particular state from the server is propagated back to the client. So the transfer is in both, both ways of uh, resources, and we'll see more about how this transfer happens and the properties of REST and all those things, okay? So what is REST? As people think REST is an architecture, okay? Uh, REST is not an architecture. It's a set of design criteria. And it's very general, it's not tied to the web, so it's not really dependent on HTTP or, you know, it's not dependent on the protocol or it doesn't assume anything about what kind of a client you should be having. It doesn't assume you should be on a browser or a cell phone or whatnot, you know. So it's very general a set of design criteria. And uh, if you see the history of uh, distributed programming, everything started with this you know, RPC style of communication, right? So if you have a RPC style of communication going on, you would actually have a method name, and you would have a set of parameters that you pass into that method. So that method is being invoked on the remote server, and those arguments are used as input parameters for those uh, remote uh, procedure call, and you get back at some kind of a result set, right? So that's uh, RPC. That is, that is the total opposite of REST. It's, it's uh, totally not RESTful, okay? Because uh, when it, so when you think of REST, what is REST? Think of REST as a sentence, okay? What is a sentence composed of? It's composed of nouns and verbs, right? You have certain, uh, some kind of nouns. There is like infinite number of nouns in the English language, right? And, and, the, and the verbs are also like, there are a lot of verbs you can operate on. If you have a story, you can publish, you can uh, close, you can, you know, you can put it in an inbox, you can do all kinds of things, right? 
So think of rest as a sentence, which is composed of uh, verbs and uh, nouns. And I mean, in RPC style of things, uh, you actually have infinite amount of uh, uh, method names. Method names is not, it's not constrained at all, right? The method name is not constrained. Whereas in REST, we basically have a set of uh, verbs that we already have decided, OK, yeah, this is Ruby meter. Yeah. So, so you can think of REST as uh, composed of uh, nouns and verbs. And when you have, when you have uh, uh, infinite amount of nouns and you have a limited amount of uh, constrained amount of uh, HTTP verbs that you can operate on, then uh, there are if you just go beyond those uh, uh, those standard set of HTTP verbs that's available for you, then you have to start thinking about okay, whenever you are going to add something which is uh, not conforming to the uniform interface, then it, it's it's kind of like a signal for you in your design that there is a resource missing. And we will see some examples of how we would go about you know, uh, looking, uh, decomposing a problem and coming up with these resources. And I'll define the resources and we'll see what a resource is, what kind of resources, how we can categorize resources and those kind of things. So, so resource, um, I just want to define the term resource before getting too far because there's a lot of confusion, right? So it could be a document, it could be a row in a database. Uh, you know, it, it reminds me of VJB, basically, it's entity EJBs. So result, result of running an algorithm, this is something really difficult to get the hang of, because basically when you're doing a search, what are you doing? You're passing in certain parameters to an algorithm, right? The search engine is, is a very re a restful uh, web service, basically. Uh, I would say, uh, not really a web service. Uh, how would you define a web service? Okay, I don't, don't want to just throw terms around without defining it properly. So web application, you know, it's for humans to consume, right? So the web service, in layman terms, is just for machines to consume. They would use the response, and they would actually take some action based on the particular XML document they receive as a response, right? So and it can be a physical object, like a chair or a pen or you know book or anything, and it can also be abstract concept. And uh, I I don't have a very good example of how abstract cons concept like courage or something can be a resource, but uh, I think the uh, restful web services book by Sam Ruby might have some examples. I have, at the end of this presentation, I have a link to all the resources. So if you're interested on in those things, you can go and read up on that. Most of the time, you, you, when you're developing Rails applications, you actually, most of the time, you have model-backed, you know, database-backed resource. And also, you will have uh, running an algorithmic resource, OK? The book categorizes uh, result of running an algorithm as an algorithmic resource. And this is kind of tricky. I can give you an example in Rails, a uh, few examples in, of how the algorithmic resource can work. One of the example I already gave you, like search, for instance. If you have a search, you can implement it in a restful way. And uh, you can get a response back. And, and there is another algorithmic thing where uh, I'll show you an example where the, it uses RESTful authentication, but it's not really actually uh, doing anything uh, to do with the database. It's more of an algorithmic thing. Okay. Uh, what do you most part in both REST tasks or REST Yes, uh, we, uh, this uh, uh, presentation focuses on RESTful uh, uh, Rails. That's the topic of uh, this uh, presentation. Because the REST concept is actually much more encompassing than Rails. Rails is just one uh, implementation of RESTful, uh, you know, set of design criteria. Okay, and we will see the uh, characteristics of uh, REST. What makes a certain thing RESTful, and why we actually need to aim for uh, those characteristics. What the problems are, and why we aim for that kind of a design. 
right? We are not talking about the soap and those kind of heavyweight approaches because those approaches are not considered restful design. Okay. Yeah, you can stop me anytime because I'm actually recording this thing. So it's okay. It's okay. I, I'm just trying to just. Um, you know, repeat the question and, you know, go over it and so on. So it, it doesn't matter. You can stop me any time to ask questions. This is for people who, if they don't, uh, if they cannot make it to the presentation, they can actually watch it later. So here is uh, uh, an example of uh, a request. A GET is a request made by the HTTP client to this particular URL. So if you say, it's, you can think of it as a www.addressbook.com, and it has contacts slash destroy slash one. One is basically the database ID of that particular uh, resource. In this case, it's a database-backed resource. So uh, is this restful or not? That's the question. And Anyone? No. Why? Uh, it has the master in the URI. Exactly. So, yes, it has the method destroy in the URI. That is the very first thing uh, that just by looking at this, you can recognize. That's one of the characteristics of a RESTful design is you don't expose the method names in the URI. It's part of the HTTP verb and if this was RESTful, it would be, uh, I'll show you, I'll get to the RESTful version of it, okay? So you will actually, you, instead of doing a GET, you will do a, a you have to do a DELETE, and the URI will be uh, consistent, uh, some domain.com slash contacts. And since you're deleting a certain resource, you have to specify the ID. So you will have one in that instance, you, but you won't have the destroy in the URI. So HTTP methods are verbs. And one of the characteristics of a RESTful design is uh, you know, uniform interface. Right? The, if, if you have read the Ganga for Design Patterns book, and the recurring theme in each and every design pattern is like you have an abstract class, and you have a uniform interface, and all the subclasses in, you know, implemented. So the client actually uses that particular interface interact with the subclasses. In HTTP, HTTP we have like a, a set of uh, well-defined methods already available. And if we use those methods, um, those are the verbs that you can operate on the nouns, right? The nouns being, you know, the contacts, you know, books, and all kinds of things that you can think of. So you have a constrained set of uh, uh, methods, unlimited, unconstrained you know, amount of nouns. And those two in combination, you can implement anything you can think of without reverting to a RPC style of you know, client-server communication. So HTTP verbs are post, get, put, delete. Of course, it has more things like head options. Head is when you have maybe you have like a, a resource which is a huge video file and you just want to get some metadata just to see okay i want to see the tags for the metadata and i want to see if this is a comedy or if this is something related to politics if i'm really interested in before i even start downloading it because it's bandwidth intensive stuff so when you do a get a head on it you'll get back uh, the metadata about the video, and then maybe you can decide to actually do a get and download the actual video. Options is uh, options is not really used in the context of Rails, and I don't remember. I read about this, but I don't remember now. So post, get, put, delete. These are the four things you'll be uh, using a lot, right? So the URIs are nouns. As you saw, the contacts was in the URI. The nouns end up in the URI. The verbs, the actual method name, ends up in the HTTP, uh, the request that's being made. The client, HTTP client uses the HTTP verb. So this is the RESTful version of the same thing I showed you earlier. 
it had Destra in the URA, but now it only has this uh, in the URA. Destra has been removed. And I use uh, basically delete as the HTTP verb in order to communicate to the server that, that, needs, that resource needs to be deleted. So let's come to the CRUD part of this thing. So we have create, read, update, and delete. So I showed you the HTTP verbs are like, uh, uh, gives you that uniform interface. It gives you generic uh, abstraction of methods available to you. So you have a cre create, re read, update, and delete of resources. And in SQL, you have similar things, right? You have insert, select, update, and delete. Which does the same thing. It creates a new record. You can do a uh, select on a particular record, and then you can update a particular record and delete a particular record, right? And in Rails, the re RESTful implementation of any resource is going to have these standard actions corresponding to these CRUD operations. Like you have create, you have show for a particular resource, and update and destroy for a given resource. So the HTTP method corresponding to these things are post to create a new resource, a get to get a particular resource, put to update a particular resource, and delete for uh, destroying a resource. So this is clear, right? How they all correspond to each other. So when you are writing a database-backed web application, you're using the SQLs, insert, select, update, delete, the active record layer knows those are the things that needs to happen. And the HTTP method that you're actually sending uh, from the form, you'll have a post, you know, you'll have a do a get. If, if form, is, form is being submitted, that's going to be a post. If it's a new resource, and when you do a, when you have a form for existing resource, that when you do a put, that's going to do an update. And the delete is when you select a particular resource and you click on a delete, it sends a hidden parameter with underscore method as delete to simulate the HTTP you know, method delete since the browsers don't support uh, anything other than get and post. So the Rails gets around this by having an underscore method for put and delete. So here is another example. If you look at this thing, uh, uh, do you think this is a restful design or it, it, it's, this is not a restful design and why? I showed them a, a, a contact slash a destroy slash one and one of you said, uh, uh, answered properly, they said it's not, uh, it's not a RESTful design. It's the same thing. You have delete method showing up in the URI. You have update method showing up in the URI. Create method showing up in the URI, right? So this is not RESTful. This one is RESTful. The URI becomes much more uniform. You have users one. Users one, what do I want to do? Do I want to retrieve that users, that particular user uh, ID one? Do I want to update it or do I want to delete it? The distinguishing factor is the HTTP verbs that uniquely identifies and the particular resource, what method needs to uh, actually be invoked on the server side. So you would actually map it to the uh, destroy method in the act controller's action method or update in the case of put or forget, it will go to the show action. So if you follow this convention, this automatically this, all the routing is done for you, right? So just by looking at the URI, you have a way of telling whether it's something is resourceful or not. And if you go back to your web applications and you start looking at the URLs, and you can uh, use the same set of uh, you know, criteria, you can ask yourself the question, okay, is this URL, you know, uh, showing all the method-related information in the URI. It should not. It should be part of the HTTP verb. 
So uh, I want to make uh, the resources, you know, I don't really like to expose the database IDs. I want to make it a search engine friendly and, you know, human friendly thing it's so that, you know, people know what it is that they're actually looking at right now, right? Users, I said, had, instead of having database ID, I have here the actual user name. Photos, instead of having the ID of the photo, I have Grand Canyon and so on. Actually, in Rails, you can implement this thing uh, using uh, overriding the two param method. And I'll also walk you through an example of how I did this on the rubyplus.org site, how I made this search engine friendly. I actually combined the ID and the search engine friendly keyword also part of the URL. So the episode and the title of the episode shows up in the URI. And that makes the uh, implementation on the server side in my controller easier. At the same time, it's also, also search engine friendly. So if you define map.resources users, it gives you all the standard uh, uh, restful actions for you. Rails will create, uh, if you have a scaffold, if you create a scaffold, it will have this declaration map.resources users in the routes.rb file. And it will create all the uh, index, create, show, update, destroy actions with default implementation for users. And that implementation will actually do all uh, index, create, show, update. You don't even have to do anything. If it's straightforward, just one resource, it will do all this thing automatically for you. It's just out of the box. So represent resources with URIs, uniform resource identifier. Why is it called as a uniform resource identifier? It's called identifier because it's unique. Okay, so every resource uh, should have a minimum number of uh, URIs. That is uh, one of the thing uh, that uh, the book actually goes through. I learned a lot by reading the book, but I haven't grasped everything from the book yet. But um, I learned a lot, and I'll be showing you how the characteristics like you know addressability and statelessness, all these things relates to the web apps we develop and also how it's applicable to web services also. Uh, what book is this again? This one? What book is this again? Uh, I, I, at the end of this, I, I'll have a list of all the books and everything. Okay. Restful Web Services by Leonard Richardson and Sam Ruby. So the contacts is the resources. I have an address book slash contacts. And if you see this, uh, one of the characteristics of this URIs is um, URI has to have a, a structure, and it has to be uniform. And I'll give you an example of what happened when I made this uniform. I, I was not even aware when I was developing the rubyplus.org site. I made the URL uniform, and w one of the members of my site wrote a four line of code, which, uh, which basically gave him an entry point into my application. And he was using my resource in a way I could never ever even imagine. So I was able, I des the way I designed this controller, it gave a programmatic ability, programmable web, web service. Think of it as a programmable web. Resource I was exposing was videos, okay? It was protected uh, be behind a, a login. It required login. But he had just four lines of code. One line to login, and he knows episode one, all the way to episode 72, he loops through each episode, he downloads, everything is automatic. I was, that was like awesome. His blog post was explained how cool Ruby is and how these four lines of things was able to, he saved so much time downloading all the episodes. You know, so I was like, wow, the thing I did really makes sense, you know. Even though I, I gave the sequences manually, I kept increasing the sequences. I had this sequence because when the RSS feed shows up, it has the latest uh, number. Episode 93 is the latest. It shows up at the top. Then the search engine knows when it was updated, and it keeps refreshing. It shows up in the RSS feed, the block search, and so on. So I'll show you. Uh, basically, um, rubyplus.org slash download slash episode ID, and that's it. The episode ID keeps sequentially going. Uh, 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 
it keeps progressing sequentially and it was easy for him to write it. So you can represent the same resource in different formats, HTML, XML, JSON. Does anybody know what JSON is? Yeah, you can say. It's okay. Yes, and if it's like, very, yeah, what, what is its uh, strength, basically, when compared to XML? It's more readable, it's more Yes, it's more, it, less angular brackets, right? And if it's like a simple data structure, you're uh, exchanging back and forth between JavaScript and stuff, it's much more easier. JavaScript can already recognize those data structures. Mm -hmm. So it depends what you're actually doing. So Gmail is actually really interesting because the URI does not change, okay? The uh, Gmail is actually a web, a web service because all the representation that's coming out of the wire, it's for the consumption of the JavaScript. So it's, that is a web service client, basically. So I said, rest, think of rest as a sentence. So here is a sentence, view the XML representation of all contacts. And here is the equivalent way of actually implementing it. You have a get HTTP verb, give me a XML representation of all contacts, a dot .xml. This is one way to tell the server, I want XML representation. There is another way to tell the server that you want XML particular representation, how can you do it? Does anyone know? Uh, request parameter, yeah, request parameter is one way. That's the third way, maybe, yeah, that's the third way. There's another way that's, imp more, uh, that's called as content negotiation. Have you heard of the term? Accept header. The client says, I can ac accept text slash HTML. It says text slash XML slash CSV, you know. So that's one way to tell the server, hey, I want to accept CSV or I want to, I want XML response back. Instead of saying it dot XML, if you, you set tax, uh, HTTP headers, headers, and there is a way to specify in Rails, and you can give it a key key on based on that, and you can actually initialize it. So get the V card representation of the contact with ID one, and here is one way to do this. VCD and it will give you back the vCard implementation of the contact. So th this is a different representation of the same resource, right? The data is the same. The representation is different. So create a new contact. Use another sentence. So you do a pause to that particular URL. In this case, when you do this using XML, you basically have a web service client interacting with your uh, Rails app. And if you design your Rails app in such a way it can handle both HTML and XML, that's the beauty of Rails. Uh, and you basically have a web application which is also a web service. So update the contact with ID 1. So you do a put. And since you need to know exactly what resource it is, you need to specify the ID. And the URI has the contacts, the noun in the URI. So how do you expose the resources? You know, the, I don't know how many of you have read the Domain Driven Design by Eric Evans. Uh, it's a really good book. And I was at the Advanced Health Studio, um, uh, and uh, Marcel Molina was there. I was talking to him, you know, uh, you guys talk about all this uh, active resource and rest and all that. You know, how do I uh, actually decompose my application? How would I go about, you know, designing an architecture kind of a thing, you know? So he was saying, uh, uh, like, if you're doing an object-oriented analysis, you always think of coming up with a cohesive domain model. So if you have an event, let's say you have an event management application and you have a Rails app for event management and it needs to start to build a billing system for billing your subscribers and 
what not, right? And you have a billing system. And the billing domain model, it's, it's, it's cohesive and it's, it's on its own. It did not be like related to the event at all, right? So he was saying, you know, you can have a billing Rails app and you can have an event management Rails app and they can be integrated or using active resource. That's uh, one good way of, you know, uh, integrating Rails apps. R Rails is coming up with different versions of Rails and it's moving so fast and actually you can integrate different Rails versions, Rails apps doing r different things uh, or if they all communicate with XML, right? So what are the things you would expose in the billing app? You know, you, ha you have to remember the active resource, even though it's very similar to active record, the interface is similar, but it, you're actually going over the wire. So what are the things you would expose in that case? You know, it's more like a, a facade. You, has, it has, you have to minimize the exchange of things going on the wire, right? So how do you expose resources? Okay, you have to determine the requested resource. What is the resource is, which is being requested? And the resource can be anything. Like I said, it can be an object, it can be an abstract concept, it can be algorithmic, uh, result of an algorithmic, uh, you know, uh, thing and so on. And you have to determine the requested representation. What representation do you want? Do you want JSON, XML, HTML, and so on? and manipulate the resources state based on the request method and parameters. So like you were, you were saying, uh, one other way you can pass in um, uh, some variables uh, to the server is by specifying the query parameters. So the request method will be the actual uh, HTTP verb and the parameters you can have certain uh, name value pairs you can pass in as long as it's within the limit of you know what uh, certain browsers can handle. Uh, I think the server is the one which, is, which has the restriction on how much you can actually have uh, as part of the URI, how many parameters you can actually have as part of the URI. And deliver an acceptable representation of the resources new state. So here is uh, another actually example instead of just talking about the theory. So here is a method. You have, a, you have this kind of code out there right now. I mean, if you're using RESTful authentication, you'll have activation, deactivation, and you know all kinds of things going on. You're using acts as stateful, state machine uh, plugin. And uh, the book, uh, the that was talking about the RESTful Web Services talks about overloaded post. And here is an example of uh, having an overloaded post. If you want to do a user dot find a particular user and you want to check if it's activated or not, you're as, uh, passing in a query parameter, name value pairs. Get users one, Q equals activated. And then if you want to activate someone, you're doing a post and you're passing in the uh, name value pair. Why would you do a post instead of a post? That's a good question. That's what I'm asking. Is this a restful design or not? I'll say no, it's not. Yes, because uh, the actual method is there in the URI. It fails the very first criteria, right? It should not be there in the URI. You can pass in, if you're searching in Google, you can go to www.google.com, search colon, Q equals something, and button equals go. Actually, Google should respond back with the result set. I, I tried that experiment, the Google doesn't work, but uh, my site actually will return back result. I'll show you an example of how I did that. And I'll show you an actual example. So, this is not restful. So, at, at least you're able to identify what is not restful, then you can start thinking about how am I going to make this thing res uh, resourceful. And here is the uh, restful way of doing the exact same thing. See what happened? All those verbs uh, on the models, user model, 
is uh, right now even though i have similar thing i actually converted the verb into a noun now the noun can go in the uri there is no problem there right so you have users one activation get okay if it's get it activated it gets it and when you do a post you are basically activating the user when you do a delete you deactivate the exact opposite of activation so see how those uh, using those four http verbs and uh, making sure you don't put the uh, method name in the uri actually helps you to refactor your code and uh, move towards something restful Yes, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, this is a, a, an example for a nested resource. It's kind of like a hierarchy, like a file structure. Think of a file structure. The book also talks about uh, file structure and how it relates to the URI. The more general thing, and then it's kind of like a tree, root of the tree, and then more general, general, general. That's how the URI is itself is structured. You can think of it that way. So the activation makes sense in the context of the user. Right? Yes, so if you have a blog and you have a post, the post is makes sense only for that particular blog, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's parent-child relationship. Think of it that way, right? So does this, I mean, I, I, I see what you're saying here, um, but I keep wondering if this, like, does this help make your application make more sense? Because it seems to me that it's, more natural to think of deactivating a user as opposed to deleting the user's activation. I mean, that's a very confined yeah, but it seems that all he did is convert that, that I, All I did was, yeah, property. you can always so, make so. every verb in the English language, you can make it a noun. Yeah, that's what we're doing. But it becomes, right? a, bit, it becomes a bit stilted, doesn't it? I, I haven't convinced you. I haven't gotten through the uh, presentation yet. Okay, by the end of this presentation, my goal is to convince you this restful design is something good yeah. and you should be aiming for. I'd be really interested to see what's the benefit of this because that's something I've been looking at REST for a while and I mean it's great for a lot of things but does this, to go to this extreme does that really help you? That's the question I would love to have answered. Okay, let's see if I can answer the question yeah. if you have the same question by the end of this presentation. <laughs> so w that's what I did. I restful design tips, turn verbs into nouns. And Sam Ruby gives, uh, uh, if there is one thing you can take out of this book, what is it? Someone asked this thing on one of the interviews on a website, I think, uh, server side or something. He said, optimize the hell out of get requests. Is that a caching part? Yes, yes. I'll come to those things. And Leonard Richardson, give everything its own URI. So you have like infinite amount of URIs. It's unique, right? So here is some of the examples of what good uh, uh, RESTful uh, design is like. You know, you have services that expose the Atom publishing protocol, Amazon S3, if you have worked with Amazon S3, uh, that's a very good uh, example. Static websites, search engines like Google, Static websites is really surprising. It's here. By nature, HTTP is stateless. So the one of the most uh, important characteristic of restfulness is statelessness. Okay. HTTP by nature is stateless. So only way you can break it is by using HTTP sessions, right? So uh, the Rails way of implementing the session is it sets a cookie on the browser some uh, big uh, unique string and what happens is and it track every re every uh, uh, request from that particular client actually sends that cookie back to the server and the server uses that as a key to the application state uh, of the client okay in an ideal scenario the client state remains on the client the server state remains on the uh, server there's a server state which is remaining on the server is called as a resource state. 
Okay, the client state which is on the client is called application state. Okay, as the uh, client goes through the different parts of the application, the client state will change. Okay, all the possible states. How can it go to the next possible state? You got hyperlinks. You have a static website. You have a list of all your favorite links, right? So the, what are the next possible states you can go? All the, uh, those links you can follow. Those links can have more uh, link, uh, links to it. So connectedness is also one of the property of restfulness. And being able to uh, go from one state to the next is also another thing. And so uh, I was talking about the uh, state. Let's just talk about the state now. So the state, the only way the uh, state propagates from the client to the server is by doing a post or a get. The client state becomes a server state and it be actually becomes a resource state and it gets persisted or something, right? And when the uh, client needs the resource state, it makes a get request and it gets the representation of it and that that way it goes in the other direction okay what wh why do we why do we actually aim for statelessness why is a good thing uh, what are the benefits of having a stateful a stateless thing stateless means the client each for each and every interaction with the web server it needs to send all the state required in order to uh, you know complete that particular request response. Right, every request because becomes like a full-fledged you know, piece of information that you know to store in the, on the service side, like if you would with the session management, but instead it's end-to-end. Uh, -end yeah, so you, even if you log in once, every time you need to send your credentials back and forth, and it's like you need to send all the state required. Even though she went through the login, she successfully logged in, she has to send it again, send her password, her user ID and password again. Because the server doesn't know. Uh, it doesn't know it's the request is coming from her or coming from him or coming from you. It cannot distinguish any of the request, previous requests. It just has the amnesia, stateless. So let's look at the problem, uh, uh, why we actually aim for statefulness. OK, she's, she logged into my site. And she, I have, let's say I, have, I just have one server handling the session, okay? Right now, my, serve, uh, my Rails app is not stateless. It's stateful. She logs in once. She doesn't uh, 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 give her user ID and pass it every time she makes a request when she's browsing through my site after she logs in. What happens is I set a cookie on her browser. She sends, actually, her uh, cookie instead of uh, user ID and password. And I actually key in using the uh, uh, cookies, the entire session string, I key into her specific uh, application state. I know if she's uh, shopping and she's got some items on the shopping cart, and if he is coming through and he's not logged in, I can distinguish his request. Because uh, if I key in using his uh, uh, session ID, I don't find uh, uh, the, his application state is entirely different, OK? So what happens if I add a new server? Let's say I, my, my site is so wildly successful, I have like millions of requests coming in. Uh, my, I have one server. I need to like have more servers thrown in in front of the load balancers, right? But my server, this server only can recognize, I can recognize her only from the server one I had. If I throw in another server, that server needs to be aware of her session. So it becomes a session. It, when, when her session becomes associated with a particular server, it's called session affinity, right? And the request has to be transferred to only one particular server. It has to be configured. So the server uh, has to be uh, session replication. You have the terminology called a session replication. I want to serve a million requests. I have like, now I have like a, a, load, a boatload of 100 servers. But her session has to be in all the 100 servers. Its session has to be replicated everywhere. Okay, that's when you use TKIP. Yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, I don't know that much. Uh, um, okay, about, yeah.
about me going to the rest of the cluster. You just go to that node where my session is stored. So it's called a sticky IP? Mm -hmm. Okay, sticky IP. So there's all kinds of gymnastics you can do get to get around the, uh, that problem. So this book go, uh, does not mention those things. It goes uh, and uh, explains the session affinity and session replication, all these kind of headaches you have. So the number one benefit of ha having stateless uh, web service or web apps are scalability. Scalability is one thing, and if you want, you know, if you want to know more, you can read the book because that's all I have right now in my mind. <laughs> so, the characteristic. What are the characteristics you saw when you look at the URI? You're able to say whether it's restful or not. So, what are some of the other characteristics of a restful uh, design? So, generic shared abstraction. We have a limited set of verbs, HTTP verbs. We have a get, put, post, delete, and that's it. Statelessness, connectedness, we already saw. So web services right now don't have a way of, it, when it gives the resources, it doesn't really give a hyperlinks. The original dissertation was talking about hypermedia and interconnectedness and all those things. And the scoping information is actually, what is scoping information? Scoping is basically when you request uh, 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 data, why should I give you uh, data set A instead of set B? Why should I give you set A of data instead of set B data? So the scoping information decides what you actually get back from the server. Stateliness, we saw connectedness, we kind of saw generic shared abstraction, we kind of saw how we use those HTTP verbs. And the scoping information, you should never, uh, it ends up in the uh, URI. So you have contacts, contact slash something, I give you something related to contacts. And if you go to users, I give you something related to users. So here is some of the examples of resource. I, I don't think you can even read it. So it's got like ton of examples version 103 of the software release, latest version of the software release, first web blog entry for October 24, 2006, Six, uh, roadmap of Little Rock, Arkansas, some information about Jellyfish, a directory of resources pertaining to Jellyfish, next prime number after 1024, next five prime numbers after 1024, Sales numbers for Q4 2004, list of open bugs in the bug database, the relationship between two acquaintances, Alice and Bob. So if you see, how can you generalize some of these things? Can you categorize some of these resources? Like we already saw uh, different types of resources. How about the next prime number after 1024? It's an algorithmic resource, right? It's a result of some kind of an algorithm on the server, right? So list the sales numbers for Q4 2004 is kind of like a report. It's generating some kind of a report. You pass in certain dates or something, and it runs some kind of algorithm, and it generates reports. So th all these things are resources. Now we will see the corresponding URIs for all each, each of these resources. So here is, I actually took the domain www.example.com and then I just focus only on the URI. So you can actually see what a RESTful URI would look like. Software releases latest.tar.gz and you have software releases 103.tar.gz and you have wiki jellyfish, search jellyfish, fish, next prime, slash, and you have the actual prime after that particular number. Next five primes, and then 1024, sales 2004, and those kind of things. And affair, slash, alice, bob. It was supposed to be funny, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's laughing anyway. So, 
here is uh, the, when you have a URI, you have to make uh, the URI structure uh, uh, uniform. It's, it has to be programmable. Okay, here is an example of you have a search jellyfish in order to search jellyfish, and you want to search something else, and you do a one and all fetish for your underwear, something like this, and you're you're totally inconsistent with the previous uh, thing uh, search you did. It shouldn't be done this way. This is totally non restful way of doing it. So uh, the script download, I actually mentioned how I designed the URI, uh, my domain slash download episode sequence number. And as long as the user is logged in, he, he can go and access the resource. And he is able to download. So he's got an entry point into my app, and he's able to use my app in, a way, in ways I did not think of. So some of the things you can do is you can add your own MIME types. You can have iPhone format. You can have MP3 format. It, a resource could be anything, right, any format. So if uh, you want something um, that's not there, Rails provides you the hooks. You have config initializers, MIME types.rb. You just go, go in there and you just register. You have a new V card or you have a micro format, anything that you can think of. And you have these things, and now we can start serving out those V card and you can create that particular structure. You can just say format.v card, and you can have, if you have a hook or something you want to customize, or you can have your own template which generates those uh, specific micro format tags for business cards and stuff like that. So it's e really easy to register new MIME types. It uh, also has other names uh, like data type and stuff like that. So MIME type has two or three different names by which it goes. So here is something I want to actually do and show it to you. Uh, kind of like a demo to illustrate uh, some of the restful nature of uh, websites. So I just want to copy this uh, URL. Oh, and go there. OK, so I can actually go here in the browser and see this, right? This is a search result. This is what would happen when you do a search for Active Merchant on my site and click on Go, okay? So you can see search equals Active, Q equals Active Merchant and commit equals Go, okay? I can do the exact same thing using curl. I can do this and I get back a response. What is curl? Is it like a command line? Yes, it's curl is a command line utility. It's uh, basically will allow you to do you can set HTTP headers, you can do a get, you can do even a post, you can even log in using a, a, a user ID password. You can test it. Yeah, you can do all kinds of, curl is a very good utility to play around with. If you have XML coming out of your web service you have designed, you can do a curl and get the XML response back. In this case, the exact same thing I did. See, I was able to do a search and I was, I'm able to get these two hyperlinks. In, this it shows the connectedness. The service I have exposed is a RESTful service and able to do a search by doing this particular query. But I did something similar trying to do for Google search mm -hmm. because the book had an example where they do the exact same thing. They have google.com, search, and then the query parameter, you can have something, button go. Google seems to be uh, actually uh, blocking people doing these automated queries. It won't let you, it won't give you the result back. You can try if you read the book. But right now, I'm not, uh, 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 you know, blocking anyone, so it's a restful service. People can actually access this thing. And people are so lazy, they want uh, automatic iPod downloader, like RSS of iTunes feed, so it downloads the videos automatically to their uh, iPad and they can just take it to go. And 
one guy just wrote a utility using curl. It does login, it does download everything. Okay, let's see what else is left. I, I, I don't want to just keep on talking about the theoretical things. And if you have like questions, you can stop me anytime. So I think that's it. So RESTful Web Services by John Cohen, RESTful Rails, Web Services for the Rails World by Ryan Hendricks, REST and Active Resource, Ryan Dagley. This guy actually blogs about the RESTful, what's new in Edge Rails. Advanced RESTful Rails is the presentation by Ben Schofield from uh, RailsConf this year. And RESTful Web Services is the book I actually had to read from cover to cover to learn about this session affinity, session replication, all those concepts. So if you have any questions, we can, uh, you know, discuss. I'll just stop this recording. <laughs>